Well, the showdown over local baby continues tonight. Livingston County officials have been demanding an address for little Naomi Burns since last week. Now, 7 investigator Heather Catalo has exclusive video that shows authorities did have the baby's last known address. Heather's here now with a look at what she's uncovered. Heather. Well, this saga certainly continues tonight. Child Protective Services workers told lawyers for the Burns family last Friday that they had a court order that required them to tell them baby Naomi's physical address. Tonight, we have the video that shows what happened when a family member gave CPS that address. Here comes Peter this is exclusive video of baby Naomi Burns during a recent portrait session with her mother, Brenda. Brenda Burns is now in hiding because the police and Child Protective Services workers have come knocking twice in the last few weeks, even though Brenda has been cleared of all child abuse allegations. And they clearly continue to want to persecute the mother as if she's a perpetrator when she's been cleared by a jury as not being one. Elizabeth Warner is Brenda's attorney. A jury did convict Brenda's husband, Josh, of abusing Naomi. Both parents and other medical experts say retinal hemorrhaging and the bleeding that was found between Naomi's skull and brain were caused by birth trauma and a severe illness. Josh is facing up to 10 years in prison and will likely lose his job as a commercial airline pilot. Without an income, Warner says Brenda was forced to move in with family friends. Now, Warner says CPS workers from the Michigan Department of Human Services, or DHS, won't leave her alone. Daughter was given back to her. She's the fit parent. And under our Constitution and the way that our Michigan Supreme Court case has interpreted it, they cannot put her child under supervision of DHS because that's what foster care is. It's supervision by DHS. Is there a Joshua here? No, no. Warner says it was this raid on Brenda's home the night of Josh's criminal conviction that prompted the mother to fear that CPS was trying to take Naomi away again. I'm with uh, CPS. To stop what Warner is calling harassment and legal terrorism, she told CPS they had to go through her and that they could correspond with Brenda only through a P.O. box. That prompted CPS to request this order from a judge last Friday that says only that the mother and or father has to provide the child's current address by 5 p.m. It is not a warrant to search a home. Excuse me, lovely ladies. Just need to get an eye on a, on a child. That's all uh, no one's home right now. They're not, they're not home at all? No. Nope. Okay. They live here, but they're not home. The address was provided, and about an hour later, a state trooper and CPS workers were at the door. It's just pure harassment. Uh, I really do not believe that uh, Naomi would have been in any kind of danger. Matt Ekman and his wife let Brenda and Naomi move in, and Ekman was ready with a camera rolling on Friday. You have to have a court order to enter my home. Okay, that I do know. <laughs> so you can supervise the child anywhere you want, but if you want to supervise the child in my home, you will need a court order. He refused to let them in. I don't believe that they are even remotely interested in Naomi's health. Um, I think anybody who's any, any contact with uh, Brenda knows that she's a very good mother and she doesn't need the help of CPS breathing down her back. Livingston County prosecutors have maintained that the failure to provide Naomi's location causes concern that Josh Burns may be violating his no contact order with his daughter. Josh denies that and sent us this statement that says, quote, in order to stop my wife and daughter from being harassed by the Livingston County Prosecutor's Office, CPS, and the Brighton Police Department, I offered to wear an ankle transmitter to provide them my location around the clock. None of these departments even responded to that, which reveals their true motives to abuse their power and continue to harass my family. Livingston County is drunk on power. They are the ones abusing my family, unquote. So obviously some strong words from them, but he offered to wear a tether. If the issue is the dad, he's offering to wear a tether or to be locked up in advance. And they wouldn't even answer that. So what are they actually accusing Brenda of doing? Well, there are no new abuse allegations, and that's why her lawyer says CPS has no actual jurisdiction in this case. All they keep saying is they're worried about the baby being with the convicted abuser, the dad. But as I just mentioned, he has offered to wear a tether and even to be locked up in advance of the sentencing to prove that he has not seen the baby. And because of this most recent police presence at her door, that's yet another reason that Brenda is now in hiding with Naomi. Prosecutors want a judge to order her to bring the baby to court next week. They're also asking for an order to get into the home where they're staying. So they'll be back in court next week. It just seems devastating. Neglectful, disgraceful. Those are just a few of the words investigators are using tonight after arresting these parents for what they discovered inside their home. 
They say the children were forced to live in a trailer. The parents were living inside the mobile home. This is all north, uh, northeast of Weatherford and new at 10 o'clock. Aaron Jones is reporting for us from Parker County. It was one of the nastiest, filthiest places that I have ever been. But the Parker County Sheriff says it's what was happening inside this Weatherford home that's truly disturbing. It was just an awful situation. Last month, four children were removed from this home and put in foster care. One child told authorities their stepfather, 20-year-old Colton Lackey, was sexually abusive and involved with child pornography. Their mother, 34-year-old Amanda Fuller, knew, knew about the abuse but didn't act on it. Both parents are now in jail. Lackey for indecency with a child by sexual contact. Fuller for possession of a controlled substance. Yesterday, we executed a search warrant. These photos document the conditions the children were living in. Authorities say drugs, including meth and cocaine, were found. There were five animals in, in, uh, on chains, some of them in the house. So you go in there thinking, what person in their right mind would live in these conditions, much less expose children and animals to these conditions. I'm glad the kids aren't there anymore. So. John Coonrad lives down the street and says sometimes he'd see the children's parents outside. Usually somebody's sitting out in this van with a light tinkering doing something. I, I get that people get lost and they do drugs and, and have a good time or whatever, but to let it affect your family, to let it affect your kids, that's just, I guess that's what drugs do. And the children range in age from 6 to 15. We did reach out to DFPS to see what prior involvement, if any, they had with this family. We're still waiting to hear back. Reporting live in Weatherford, Aaron Jones, CBS 11 News. Aaron, thank you for getting Bioprotective Services investigates more than 90,000 reports of suspected abuse. No doubt they save lives, but all too often attorneys say, Children are taken from innocent parents. Tonight, 7 Action News reporter Kim Russo shows us why it's so important to know your rights if CPS comes calling. We want to be clear. This story is not against Child Protective Services or police. People who investigate child abuse dedicate their lives to saving kids, and they do just that. But sometimes there are mistakes. It costs one woman everything. She wants to make sure people know it can happen. There is no amount of compensation that can never get back what I've lost. Julie Bomber lost almost everything when she tried to do the right thing. When her sister said she couldn't raise her newborn son, Julie took in baby Philip and offered to adopt him. Then when he was five weeks old, he suddenly stopped eating. When the results came back, they said that there was bleeding in the brain. A doctor at the hospital diagnosed him with shaken baby syndrome. Julie, in her 20s, with few resources, found herself unable to pay a doctor to review that diagnosis at trial. She was sent to prison for 15 years. After almost five years in prison, the Innocence Project helped exonerate her. An expert found an MRI that proved little Philip suffered a stroke, not trauma. However, by then, Philip had been permanently adopted. She had no right to see him. To be told that I would have no contact with him. You know, that's a cross that I'm going to bear for the rest of my life. You know, that's a heartache. Do I think the system works? No. Child Protective Services defense attorney Sonia Cannon says all parents need to be aware. Even the innocent can find themselves under investigation for child abuse. You better contact an attorney and you better do it immediately. It can happen at a hospital with an unexplained illness or if your child says something that raises a red flag at school. That's we don't need a warrant. We're CPS. We don't, we don't need a warrant. This is video posted online by a local mom investigated after her special needs son said at school she didn't feed him when she says she simply changed his diet. Would you know what to do? She told the CPS worker an attorney told her to ask what the allegations were before deciding whether to let her in the house. Who told her that? The attorney. Is well, that true I don't or know. No? Don't call these attorneys because they don't know what they're talking about. Technically, this woman doesn't have to let her in at home. Attorney Cannon says this is a big question parents have, and you can see why. She recommends parents ask the allegations and then, based on that information, decide should they call an attorney or let the worker into their home because the home will help prove the allegations are false. After all, while the investigator does need a warrant to force entry, if you don't let them in, they may ask a judge to remove your children pending an investigation. We are in the state of Michigan. Do you understand what yes. we do? Yes, I do. We can't remove children. Julie says the devastating lesson she learned 
is don't let the fact you know you are innocent result in you letting your guard down. So as a layperson, you put your trust in them and you don't expect the system to fail. And unfortunately, the system failed. And I just happened to be a victim of that. Attorneys say if parents do speak to a child abuse investigator, be it a CPS worker or doctor, it is not a bad idea to grab your phone and calmly say you plan to record the interaction so there are no misunderstandings. A lot is at stake. The state has also provided this pamphlet to help educate parents about this process with the goal of protecting children. We'll have a copy of it at our website, wxyz.com. In the newsroom, Kim Russell, 7 Action News. This is paperwork in the case of three children who were stabbed to death allegedly by their own mother in Ellis County is revealing more details about the tragedy and the CPS history. Thanks for being with us. I'm Jason Wheeler. Chris and Cynthia are both off. Let's start off with a recap of this tragic case. 25-year-old Shamaya Hall is charged with three counts of capital murder tonight. Five of her children were found stabbed at a home in Italy earlier this month. Three of those children died. Senior crime and justice reporter Rebecca Lopez is joining us now live from the WFAA newsroom. And Rebecca, on the subject of those children, you read a very disturbing warning in that state paperwork today. Jason, CPS said in multiple court filings that the children were in danger of serious bodily injury or possible death because their mother was dealing with a drinking problem and untreated mental health issues. Now, here are some quotes from a petition to terminate Shamaya Hall's parental rights. The department says it was worried Hall continues to drink until she passes out and could result in serious injury or possible death due to leaving her children unattended for hours at a time. And the department is concerned that due to Ms. Hall's untreated and unmedicated mental health issues, she places the children at risk, which could cause serious injury or possible death when she becomes a threat to herself and to others. Jason. So Rebecca, how did CPS first get involved with this family uh, to begin with? Well, this all started, Hall's involvement with CPS started in June of 2020. That's when police were called to Hall's home in Forney. After police say her five-year-old son went to a neighbor's home and told them that uh, his mother was dead. When police got there, they found Hall passed out and unresponsive. Police were able to revive her, but say she was under the influence of some form of drug and was intoxicated. Within days, CPS filed a petition to remove the children, saying Hall engaged in conduct that knowingly placed her children with persons or engaged in conduct which endangered the physical and emotional well-being of the children. The court agreed, and CPS was named the sole managing concern. Okay, so uh, a lot of people have questions about this, Rebecca, then. If CPS had possession of these children, then why were they with their mother and what was taking so long to sever her parental rights? Well, the mother was not supposed to be around those children, according to court documents. Her visitation with the children was supposed to be at a CPS facility, but that is one of the things that they are still investigating, why the children were alone with the mother. The process does take a while, and there was supposed to be a final hearing in July of this year to terminate her rights, but unfortunately, that did not happen soon enough, Jason. Certainly too late for those children. Rebecca, with that new information today, thanks for uh, filling us in. Right here, handprints of shit all over the entire room. Your feet just stick to all the shit in there. That's the nastiest house I've ever been in. It's what officials are calling a house of horrors. Disturbing body camera video shows a house in Oklahoma covered in feces. Inside, three children living amongst bugs and animal waste. I mean, I gotta feel like I got a pretty strong gut. That was as nasty as I've ever seen. Unsettling footage shows Stillwater police officers inside the home responding to reports of child sexual assault. Inside, officials finding a disturbing scene. Yeah. Video shows feces smeared all over the walls and officers can be heard saying it's all over the home. Is this what you're talking about cleaning up the carpet? I mean, there's poop everywhere. 
Officials were called to the house back in March, where 35-year-old Stephen Kittle allegedly sexually assaulted a four-year-old girl back in January. Can you go ahead? Go ahead and put your hands on your back for me. Can I ask what's going on? All right, right so now going? you are under arrest for child sexual assault. Okay, we're not going to talk about it while we're here. We'll talk about it back at the police department, okay? Detectives say Kittle later admitted to the sexual assault saying it happened on multiple occasions as a one-year-old watched on. Both children lived in the home along with another 18-month-old child, six dogs and three cats. Kittle also lived in the home alongside his wife, 26-year-old Lindsay Pratt, and his mother, 59-year-old Robin Kittle. All three adults are now charged with child neglect after officials found the home in squalor. Bro. That is the worst house I've ever been in right there. Video shows officers walking through the home, taking inventory of the area. According to court documents, quote, the air was thick and musty, which made breathing difficult. We could not complete the walkthrough without taking breaks outside for fresh air. Video shows one officer remove himself from the home and begin spitting and gagging outside. Trade you for a sec. After an initial visit, court documents say the 18-month-old girl's hands were, quote, covered with dried feces, which she rubbed in her hair and eyes. Court documents go on to say, quote, it was obvious the children smeared the feces because of the size of the handprints. She's like, it's, we're trying to clean up. You go in this room, and it looks like you just put shit all over your hands and like all over the place. Inside the same room, officials say nails were found sticking out of a bed frame, and children were often locked up to prevent them from eating food out of the refrigerator. The children were taken into custody by the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. All three adults are now being held in the Payne County Jail. Reporting for Long Crime Network. Uh, North Texas Child Protective Services caseworker is in jail tonight, accused of online sexual solicitation of a minor. Adrian Martinez was arrested Tuesday, we're told, by the Texas Department of Public Safety. He remains in jail in Tarrant County tonight. A CBS spokeswoman tells us that he was removed from his caseworker duties and is currently on administrative leave during this investigation. When a child dies from ab uh, abuse, that is, the first question many people ask is, where was CPS? Caseworkers in Texas take on an estimated 18 cases at a time. Turnover is high and the ones who stay sometimes get burned out. Investigative reporter Cheryl Mercedes says two days, spent two days on the job with workers in Harris County. Cheryl? Well, in the last few months, I've done a series of investigations into CPS. Until now, CPS told me they had no comment, but now they are giving us access. They want people to understand what a caseworker is dealing with day in and day out. We spent the day with an investigator who was working a case that made news the day before. You may recall it was a toddler who was killed when he was hit by a car. And there's just always things going on left and right in the city. It never stops. Stephanie Shremblin is a different kind of caseworker. She is a child fatality investigator. You ever get burned out? There's been a couple times I've been burned out. Um, not in the fatality unit yet, um, but in regular investigations, there was times. Shremblin's case involves 21-month-old Alan Vieta. The toddler was hit by a car and killed in the parking lot of an apartment complex. Surveillance video shows his mom, Giselle Vasquez, holding her infant, walking several feet ahead of the boy. She was charged with child endangerment. Shrimplin must interview the children's father to determine whether the surviving sibling is safe. Look at you. 
Look at all that hair. Emmy. Shrimplin takes the baby to a private room to see if there are any marks or bruises on her body. I need to check her uh, stomach and her legs and her bottom. Once Shrimplin determines the child is healthy, she interviews her father. When Alan was living, how was your discipline with him? Once the interview is over, the young man grabs his phone. He breaks down after watching a video of his son. <laughs> Hang in there. I'm sorry. As Shrimplin wraps her interview with the child's father, the mother, Vasquez, who just made bail, arrives. Because I'm just trying to figure out, like, where the evidence is to why you got arrested. Vasquez tells Shrimplin she fainted and does not remember much. She also mentions another surveillance camera may tell a different story. Sometimes there are multiple stories and there are discrepancies in stories and you just try to do your best to find out who plays what role and then just try to figure out what the truth is. CPS takes the information they gather and decides if a child is safe. If not, they consider several options, including placing them with other relatives or getting the court involved.